Hello, everyone. My name is Moshe Domotaya, and I'm going to be talking to you about the rationale and principles for conducting meta-analysis. I want to welcome you to this course, and I want to tell you that this is an important course because meta-analysis has a lot of important functions, and there's a lot of there's a lot of ways in which it is it is really helpful and it is very important. It, it forms the bedrock of a lot of what we do in evidence-based medicine and evidence-based population health or public health. Therefore, I would implore you, I, I, wanna, I wanna congratulate you for taking the time to be part of this course. And I, I hope that um, you can spend time to, uh, to digest, not just this lecture, but subsequent lectures and the workshop that come with it, because I'm pretty positive that you would find the contents of this course, of this course pretty useful um, irrespective of whether you're focused on clinical, on clinical work or you're focused on population health or public health. So in this course, we'll essentially be, in this lecture, we will essentially be talking about rationale and principles of meta-analysis. And I will talk about um, the steps, the nine steps that are involved in actually conducting the meta-analysis. In subsequent lectures, we will be talking about the details of each of those steps and what you need to do to, to ensure that you conduct a meta-analysis that actually worth its salt. But before we move on to how, to, how we conduct meta-analysis, let's talk about why exactly do we conduct systematic reviews and meta-analysis and what's the difference between a systematic review and meta-analysis? Many people are not new to the concept of literature reviews. For, for right from our first, right from early ideas in the university, we have assignments, we have projects that require that we review the literature and we review the literature. But what's the difference between the literature review that we do often and having a systematic literature review, a systematic review? Essentially, what a systematic review does is really, the aim of a systematic review and how it's different from a review that is not systematic is that a systematic review endeavors to cover the body of work, the whole body of work that's relevant to the question. If you're interested, for instance, in looking at whether multivitamins are helpful for pregnant women, some of the problems with, with reviews that are not systematic is that you know, people just go out there, get on the internet or get into journals and pick whatever studies they find. If you pick whatever studies you find, if, you, if it ends up that some of the studies you're more familiar with are studies that show effects or studies that are concentrated in a particular population or studies that are concentrated in a particular area, maybe an area that's close to where you work or areas that you, you're more familiar with, it turns out that what you find, the inference that you take away from your review might not represent the inference you would have taken away if you had looked at all the studies that are in the field. And that's the problem that a systematic review endeavors to solve by having a clear set of, a clear set of procedures that's articulated and then you follow those procedures and you're able to identify studies and based on the studies you identify, you are able to, you know, to synthesize those studies, reach conclusions, and reach conclusions, and reach conclusions about what the body of work relevant to this question actually, I mean, actually, actually says. But if it is not systematic, you might find a set of studies that do not represent the full body of work, and we might come off, we might come up with inferences that are different than what we would have come to if we looked at the full body of work. Now let's talk about the difference of relationship between systematic review and meta-analysis. So like I just described earlier, the sy a systematic review is a comprehensive appraisal of all the relevant research, the full body of work of a clearly formulated question. You have a clear question. Does multivitamins 
work for women in pregnancy, not just work for women, does multivitamins have a specific effect in women in pregnancy? Does it affect neonatal mortality? Is there a relationship between multivitamins and neonatal mortality? That's a very specific question. And you figure out how to find the, all, all the papers that are relevant to this work, and then you follow a set procedure to, to, to interpret the, out, the findings from these papers and synthesize that together. Now, a better analysis flows from a systematic review because the question arises, if you're looking at all the papers that talk about multivitamins and neonatal mortality, for instance, and you have 20 papers, in some of the papers you find no effect, in others you find effects, in some you find smaller effects, in others you find bigger effects. You can talk, all of, you can talk about all of this in the, in the narrative. But one thing that we can also do is to find a way to integrate all the effect measures that we find from each of these studies. And a meta-analysis is the use of statistical techniques to integrate, to synthesize all these quantitative measures that we find in a systematic review. So essentially, a meta-analysis um, flows from a systematic review. After you've conducted a systematic review, you've, you've defined a clear question, you've gone out there to find the papers that are relevant to this, to this question, and you've looked at these papers. A better analysis is, is a, a series of statistical procedures that helps you to synthesize and integrate the effect measures from these papers. So that's the relationship between a meta-analysis and a systematic review. So you can conduct a systematic review and stop at that and just provide a narrative, a narrative of the findings from the primary papers. But you can go an extra step to actually take the effect measures from these papers and synthesize them statistically so that we, we have an average effect from all that. And that's what a, a meta-analysis entails. And in this course, as we go through subsequent lectures, we would learn how, we would learn how to conduct a systematic review and how to conduct a meta-analysis. So I just spoke about what a meta-analysis is. And one of the reasons why, the core reason why we want to conduct a meta-analysis after we've done a systematic review is to synthesize the effect measures. For instance, when you look at, when you look at this, this um, when you look at this slide and you look at the effect of calcium on serum ferritin, Essentially, when people, the question that's been asked in this study, for instance, is when people take calcium, does it affect the iron metabolism? Does it, does it affect the iron status? Does it affect any specific measure for iron status that's been used here is serum ferritin? When you look at the series of studies that we have in this meta analysis, you would see that the effect here for each of the studies, it's kind of in different, all over the place. For some, the effects are bigger than others. For some, it's in the opposite direction. So what conclusion should we take away from this study? You can write a narrative about a bunch of, about how the effects differ. But one other thing that we can do is to use a meta-analysis to do a bunch of other things. For instance, someone might, be, might want to ask the question that overall, in a population, if we decide to, um, supplement with calcium, with calcium, what should we expect to see? What effect should we expect to see overall on serum ferritin in the population? In that case, we're looking for the average causal effect. And the narrative review would not be able to tell us that overall what we, should we find. That's one thing that, it is, that we have a suite of statistical steps to kind of take all the effect measures from each of these studies and find a way to find an average of all that. And that's one thing that we can do with the, with the meta-analysis. The other question we, you might have somebody asking is that, well, we see that all these studies are kind of all over the place. So how do we know? We see that it's beneficial in some cases, not beneficial. In, in some cases, it reduces, in some cases, it increases certain phrasing. How do we know which population 
to us to use this to supplement. Essentially, we see that the effects of calcium, of calcium intake on serum ferritin has a lot of heterogeneity. It's not homogeneous. But how do we know when it increases serum ferritin and when it reduces serum ferritin? That's one thing that we can use the meta-analysis to, to do and say, well, if we look at the places, if we look at, um, is there a way for us to figure out whether, and there's a lot of, um, when, when you look at these studies, there's a lot of differences in these studies. For some of these studies, some of the calcium is coming from food. For some of them, it is coming from supplements. For some of them, it is, it is a, a general population. For some, it's the population of women. For some, um, the baseline ion status, baseline, baseline serum ferritin is normal in the population. For others, these are people who are borderline base, baseline serum ferritin. So you might want to ask the question, when is when does calcium intake increase or reduce serum ferritin? So a meta-analysis can help us to figure out what exactly is driving the heterogeneity in the body of studies that addresses this question, including whether it is how much calcium you are taking, meaning the dose of the exposure. So, and there are, there's a couple of other things that we can do with the meta-analysis. Sometimes it is not the causal effect, the relationship between an exposure and an outcome that we're looking at. We're just looking at the prevalence or incident rates across different geographies or different timelines. And we want to get an overall prevalence estimate or incidence estimate. A meta-analysis is, is, is a, a meta-analysis provide, provides us with a statistical framework to kind of synthesize um, prevalence across different studies. Sometimes the question we're interested in is a comparative evaluation of two interventions. For instance, we have multiple potential anti-hypertensives anti in our toolkit if we want to treat hypertension. But which one is better? Under what conditions? You might be interested in the question of whether diuretics are better than calcium channel blockers. But when you look at the literature, you find that there's not a lot of studies that have actually compared calcium channel blockers to diuretics. And there's, there's gonna be a lot of problems with trying to start that kind of study. You might not be able to find equipoise, meaning that you can have um, ethical issues around the fact that I mean, you can have ethical issues. But besides that, sometimes it's just difficult to accumulate the, pat the patients and find the funding for that kind of study. One way to resolve this dilemma is to do what I mean is to do an indirect effect meta analysis or what we call the network meta analysis. Essentially, say that even if we don't have studies that have compared diuretics to calcium channel blockers, but we have studies that have compared diuretics to maybe placebo and compared calcium channel blockers to placebo also, and then we can use a meta analytic framework um, to to synthesize and find estimates for the comparative effects of diuretics and calcium channel blockers. Because even though we do not have a basis to compare them to, they would not have studies comparing them to one another, we have studies that have compared them to a third, a third um, intervention or a third compar comparator. Like I mentioned in the previous slide, Meta-analysis can also be used to pull prevalence or incidence estimates. For instance, we might be interested in, say, the incidence of malaria across Africa. It might be onerous to say, okay, let's go out there and design a study, um, a sample that's representative of Africa, example, all through Africa. The option, we might have the option of just going out there. And we have a lot of studies, a lot of DHS studies that have measured 
that have indicators measuring malaria, malaria incidents, um, malaria incidents across so many countries in Africa. One thing we might want to do is to say, why don't you get all these studies that are already existing together and find a way to synthesize them in a way that gives us information about the prevalence of malaria across Africa. So a meta-analytic framework, meta-analysis provides a statistical framework for us to be able to do that kind of work. So this is an example of a study that uses meta-analysis to explore the heterogeneity relating to a particular causal effect. So just, just a year or two ago, there was a lot of debate out there about whether masks do in fact work in preventing COVID-19 infection. And because it was very early in the pandemic, it was difficult. We, don't, we didn't have enough data on people who are using, who are using masks or studies that are used, looked at masks in relation to COVID-19. And accumulation that, accumulating that data would take some time. So these, um, of these authors looked at other infections, respiratory infections that had high reproductive, that had high propensity to spread that had caused pandemics um, in recent memory. And looked at the data, studies looking at the effect of masking on the, on, on, on the risk of infection in those pandemics. And they synthesized those studies. When you look at those studies, you might find that, well, yes, there is an effect. But the question they're asking in this study is that beyond whether masks are actually useful or they have an effect, does it matter what kind of what kind of mask? And you know, if we think back, cast our mind back to early in the COVID-19 COVID pandemic, we would understand, we would recall why this is an important question. There was a time very early in the pandemic when people started using masks and many places ran out of masks. And we had healthcare providers who did not have enough PPEs and people could, there were not enough PPEs to go around. And the question of whether, what kind of mask can we just use? Can we just use, um, you know, can we just use improvised masks? And what kind of mask can we use? Therefore, it was important to figure out, to answer the question, does the kind of mask, we know that masks are working, but the kind of mask, does it work? And the meta-analysis in this case provided a framework for the authors of this study to answer the question in the context of earlier pandemics, did masks work? Yes, we knew that masks worked, but would improvised masks work? And what kind of masks would work? And when you look at this, um, this um, table we have here, it kind of shows us that the N95 mask really had significant, performed significantly better than other kind of masks, even surgical, surgical masks. Now, apart from still on the question of the use of meta-analysis to explore heterogeneity, this is a very important contribution that we can, that meta-analysis allows us to allows us to make. Because when you look at the narrative review, it is difficult to come to conclusions about what kind of you know, you can you can you can look at the set is a, a bunch of studies and say, well, does masks would does would using masks protect um, against a respiratory infection? Well, when it comes to whether does this depend on the kind of mask? Does this de depend on you know how long you use the mask? Does this depend on what kind of work you do or how close you get to? potential sources of infection, then the native review becomes difficult. You need some kind of statistical tools to help you to own down to those questions. And that's where a meta-analysis can be of huge value. 
this study we're looking at here essentially tries to answer the question, um, is the study looking at the effect of multivitamin supplement that a woman uses during pregnancy on child survival? And one thing that the authors have done here is to explore whether we, we knew for a very long time that you know, when you look at the data, when you look at the studies, you see that multivitamin, like the use of multivitamin supplement does in fact have an effect. But when you go beyond the question of does it have an effect to have an effect for whom, under what conditions, that's where the use of meta-analysis to look at heterogeneity in the body of studies, looking at the effect of multivitamin supplement used in pregnancy on child survival comes into question. So the first thing, when you look at this study for this table, for instance, you see that the effects seem to be a little bit more pronounced um, on stillbirth compared to later in, in life. But also when you start looking at the different subgroups, like infant sex, does it matter whether the, the, the baby that the woman is carrying is male or female? We see that it doesn't make so much of a difference. It works well for both of them. Um, but you see that it does matter when you look at gestational age at enrollment, meaning that when the woman starts, when at what age, at what gestational age does the woman start using the multivitamin supplement? You see that if the woman starts using it, um, I mean, you see that it, it, it looks like the time that time the, the time of enrollment does matter. But by and large, we see that the multivitamins, uh, one the key takeaway here is that. You know, there doesn't seem to be too much heterogeneity um, on the on on stillbirth on on, on on the effect of um, prenatal multivitamin supplementation on stillbirth. In respect of how you break down, um, in respect of the subgroups that you look, you tend to find the effect of multi, prenatal multivitamin supplementation on stillbirth. But how but how are we able to answer this question? It is through the benefit of using meta analytic techniques and applying that to the body of studies that have looked at, that have, that have examined this question. Now, the other benefit of meta analysis that I mentioned is in indirect comparisons. And when you look at the schema here, you see that. So that schema kind of shows us the strength, the body of studies that have compared the relationship between um, the interventions that are represented by those, I mean, the bulbs. You see that there's been a lot of studies that have looked, like, looked at the relationship between, uh, I mean, there's, there's been a lot of studies that have looked at, that have found relationship between beta blockers and placebo. You see the same thing for diuretics and placebo. But if you're interested in comparing the effect of diuretics to beta blockers, there's really just not a lot of study out there. Or if you're interested in looking at the effect of calcium channel blockers to beta blockers, there's not a lot of study out, studies out there that have done this. But we know that there's a lot of studies that we have that have looked at the effect of diuretics, essentially comparing diuretics to placebo. And those that have compared CCBs to placebo, and those that have compared um, ACE inhibitors to placebo. So even though we don't have studies that have directly compared these anti to one another, we can use a meta analytic framework to deduce estimates of the comparative effectiveness of these anti-epidemics anti to one another. That would be difficult to do just from a narrative review because you don't even have studies that have compared them to one another that you want to wait, I mean, that, I mean, that you want to um, consider in the narrative framework. So the next, now that we've talked a lot about the advantages of and the, the, the uses of meta-analysis and the ways in which it can be valuable in answering certain kinds of questions that we might not otherwise be able to answer. 
we should talk about the types of meta-analysis that we have. So we've talked about the traditional meta-analysis that's looking at how to synthesize effect measures, causal estimates addressing from the body of work addressing a particular question. We've talked about the fact that sometimes you can use meta-analysis to synthesize measures that are not effect measures, such as prevalence estimates or incident estimates. But all of these are still approaches to synthesizing effect measures from different studies that are, that are addressing the same question or very, it's a similar question. But at times, another approach that we can look at is to say, rather than say, okay, we have 10 studies that have looked at the effect of calcium intake on serum ferritin, and let's look at the effect estimates in each of those 10 studies and synthesize the effect estimates. What if we're able to tell each of the, of the authors of these 10 studies to send us the individual data for each of these 10 studies? And then we can synthesize this individual data together and then conduct, conduct and, and then conduct an analysis. In that case, that's what we would call an individual participant meta-analysis. There are times when that can be advantageous, but that's not a topic that we'll be mostly covering in this, um, in this course. But we just wanted to understand that that's a potential approach that people take when, I mean, in terms of meta-analysis, in terms of synthesizing studies. So this course is, primarily focused on traditional meta-analysis, essentially meaning that we're focused on how to synthesize effect measures for causal estimates from a series of studies, the body of work speaking to a specific causal relationship. If there's enough time in this course, we might look at meta-analytic meta approaches to synthesizing other kinds of estimates such as prevalence estimates, incidence estimates, or even those response analysis. But we would not be covering network, network analysis or indirect comparisons, and we would not be covering individual patient, um, individual partner data meta-analysis in this study, in this course. Now I'm gonna to move to the second part of this, um, of this lecture, which is now that we understand what its systematic review is and how it differs from just our general narrative review. And what the meta-analysis is, and now it is related to the systematic analysis. And the different pur the purpose and different purposes that the meta-analysis is can be used for, and some of the different types of meta-analysis that we do. It's time for us to go on and talk about how exactly do we conduct a meta-analysis. And that would be the core of most of the conversations that we would have in subsequent lectures. But now, as an introduction, I will talk about the nine steps that the meta-analysis, a, a systematic review and meta-analysis would entail. And those steps would be further explicated in subsequent lectures in this course. So there are nine essential steps that would be involved in a meta-analysis, a systematic review and meta-analysis. The first two steps is to plan the review, involves planning the review. And after that, the next five steps has to do with actually conducting the review itself. And the last two steps is how do we communicate our findings from the review? So in terms of planning the review, the first thing you need to do, just like in any study, is to figure out the need for a review. Is there a need for a review? Is there a reason why we should spend all this time and resources trying to figure out, trying to synthesize studies that are look, that are examined, investigated the effect of calcium intake? 
and serum for eating, or prenatal multivitamin supplementation and child outcomes? That's the first question you need to answer. Now, if you're able to successfully answer that question and you come to the determination that there's the need for a review, there's a scientific and practical need for a review, the next thing is to go forward and develop, develop a review protocol. So a systematic review, one of the differences between a systematic review and just a narrative review that, um, that is not systematic is that we don't make up the methods that to move on. No, you have to, you ha you have to articulate the procedures and steps you want to take in this study ahead of time. And then you follow those procedures. That's what brings credibility to your systematic review. Now, the next step, after you have a, a review protocol, which kind of articulates the steps and procedures you want to follow in conducting your review, the next step is to actually go ahead and follow those steps and do the things that you plan to do. One is to go ahead and develop a literature search strategy. You would recall that the difference between systematic review and a non-systematic one is that the body of studies that you're, you're using in your review is not just a convenience sample from the studies that have examined this question. No, you're aiming to bring together all the works that have actually addressed the well-formulated question that you have determined is worthy of review. So you have to come up with a plan to find all the studies that are relevant. That, that's what developing a such strategy entails. Develop a plan, usually what these entails is being able to write a search code that you apply and, and figuring out what databases that you want to go to look for your questions or approaches to identify all the questions that might be relevant, all the body, all the studies that might be relevant to your question. Now, when you assemble all these studies, you, might, you can have a ton of them. You must now you have to be able to select which of them you would actually use in your actual analysis. In your protocol, you must have articulated how you would go from the ton of studies that your search strategy captured to the actual studies that you would select for your analysis. And after you've figured out, sometimes you go out there, you have a search strategy and you're able to assemble up to 2000 studies initially, but by the time you go through your selection procedure, you have a more manageable number of studies. Maybe you find some um, 30, 20 to 30 studies that have looked at the effect of calcium intake on iron status. And then you go into each of those studies. Already in your protocol, you've determined which effects measures you want to extract and synthesize together to answer your question. So you go to, into those studies, into those papers and extract the information you need. A lot of times it's not just the effect measure. Sometimes it's just, you need the effect measures. Sometimes you're interested in nitrogenating. So you need information about the third variable that you think might be modifying the effects of your exposure or your outcome. So you have determined ahead of time, what are all the variables that you need? You go to your papers, you extract those variables. And then the next thing is to synthesize your data and also assess the quality of the body of work that you have, that you're working with to answer this question in your meta-analysis. So after we move from there, the next step is to, once you've done your analysis, to now determine how to communicate the outcome from your studies. In subsequent lectures, we'll talk about how we write the report and extract recommendations from, met met from an analysis that we've done for meta analysis for um, in, in the course of our meta-analysis. And then the last step is 
you know, given the body of work that we have right now, what does this, what is the implication for practice, maybe clinical practice? What is the implication for what kind of, should we be using CCBs or diuretics for whom? Should we be prescribing prenatal, prenatal multivitamin supplementation for whom? Is it for everybody? Is it for some subset of people? That in effect is what is the reason why we're conducting meta-analysis. Sometimes it is not at a clinical level, it's at the population level. But as we proceed in this course and upcoming lectures, we will take you through the steps for understanding um, the steps to guide you on how you can actually go through these nine steps and complete a meta-analysis. I'm just gonna spend the next few minutes to shed a little bit more light on a couple of steps out of these nine steps that we just talked about. And the key one that I will spend time on in this lecture, because you would have a lot of time, the, the, the series of lectures that we have in this course, essentially are patterned around these nine steps. They're designed to help you to develop some facility in being able to articulate and implement these nine steps in your own studies. The first part is identifying the need for a review. Do we actually need to summarize to conduct a meta-analysis for the body of work that looks like that 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 have considered the effect of prenatal micronutrient supplementation? Of prenatal multivitamin supplementation on child childhood households. The first thing is for you to even to be clear about what question exactly do you want to answer. And the clarity about the question means that you are clear about what population. You're asking a question in, are we talking about pregnant women? Are we talking about people in Africa? Are we talking about postpartum women? Are we talking about people at risk of hypertension? Are we talking about people who are pregnant in this hypertension? You have to be clear about what population and you have to be clear about the intervention or exposure you're interested in. Are you interested in the effect of CCB of asymptomatic blockers compared to diuretics? Or are you, are you interested in the effect of physical activity on cancer risk? The second thing is that it's not sufficient to have a population in mind and know your intervention. You have to know compared to what. If you're interested in the effect of diuretics or the, the effect of physical activity on cancer risk compared to what? Is it compared to lesser physical activity or compared to no physical activity at all? If you're looking at the effect of calcium channel blockers on the control of hypertension, what's your comparator? Is it placebo? Is it diuretics? And finally, you have to have a clear outcome. What's your outcome? Is it the risk of hypertension? Is it hypertensive complications? Is it neonatal mortality? Is it stillbirth? Is it, is it under five mortality? You have to be, there has to be clarity about the populations the intervention or exposure, the comparator and the outcome. And this is, you know, these variables are what people would um, summarize with the, with the, with the, with the um, common acronym, ICO. Now, it is important for, after you've defined your population, your intervention and comparator and, and outcome, you know, for instance, you're now interested in asking the question, does regular exercise, Lower the risk of stomach cancer among adults. You have a population here, adults. You have an outcome. 
stomach cancer, you have um, you have an intervention, regular exercise, even though the comparator is not articulated here, you would have a comparator. Now you have a question. Just having a question does not mean that you're ready to do a review or you've identified the need for a review. You also have to figure out, perhaps there's a review, a, current, a new review that's looked at this question. So you don't need to duplicate efforts. You can just find that. So you go out there and search whether there are reviews that have looked at the question you've just formulated. Sometimes you would find reviews, but some of those reviews are outdated. And what does it mean to be outdated? Meaning that some time have passed and in the intervening time between when that last review was done and the current time, there's been a couple of new studies that have been published. Or sometimes there's been a study in the past, but that study, I mean, there's, still, there's just some void in that study, meaning that even though there are no new studies, heterogeneity was not explored. For instance, look at the, the paper we showed earlier that looked at the heterogeneity in the effect of prenatal or multivitamin supplementation on target outcomes. Of course, there's been, a, there's, there's been reviews that have looked at the effect that we knew at that point that prenatal supplementation does in fact reduce child mortality. But a lot of the work preceding that work had not looked at heterogeneity in detail. So that was a justification for a new review that was just not answering the question, does prenatal multivitamin supplementation work in preventing child mortality? But who does it work for? And under what circumstance? So these are all questions that you need to bear in mind and you need to explore after you've been able to formulate a clear question that is worthy of a review. And there are several ways to identify whether there's a research gap so that you're not just duplicating effort. Sometimes a study has just not been done. I mean, there's, there's just been a, a bunch of studies. There's not been any review at all. So you want to go in there and find the papers, kind of synthesize them. Sometimes it's about heterogeneity, just like I mentioned. You want to go in there. Sometimes um, there's a bunch of studies, but some of the studies are pointing in one direction, some are pointing in another direction. And you want to find a way to synthesize those studies together. Sometimes we don't even know whether there's a sufficient body of studies in this, that have addressed this question. So sometimes we, I mean, we, the question is so nov novel, but we articulate a protocol for a systematic review and you go out there to systematically find these studies and you come short. You find out that, you know, there's just not enough studies out there for us to even conduct a analysis or for us to even review. But you've made a contribution in the sense that you figure out that there's not enough studies here. We need primary studies in this area. Or even if we have a bunch of studies, maybe some of these studies, there are deficiencies in them. There are certain areas of questions that they're not addressing that's very important for practice. And those are all contributions that you can find from your systematic review. So at this juncture, I hope you've been able to, I mean, I hope I've been able to communicate to you what a systematic review is. And now it is different from a general narrative review that's not systematic. And you'll be able to understand what a meta-analysis is 
as a statistical approach that builds on the statistic review and just applies the statistical framework to synthesizing the quantitative measures from the studies that are included in our review. And I've also been able to talk about different kinds of meta-analysis, the different reasons why we might conduct a meta-analysis, which is beyond synthesizing quantitative measures, we might be interested in heterogeneity and quantifying the drivers of this heterogeneity. Sometimes we might, um, I've talked about the different kinds of meta-analysis that we might have, apart from the traditional meta-analysis that synthesizes causal effects from the body of work examining a well-formulated question, we might, be, we might be interested in synthesizing other measures that are not effect measures, like prevalence estimates, incidence estimates. Sometimes it's not, sometimes we're trying to answer a question where there are no studies, a question about comparative effects, where there are no studies that are directly compared the two interpretations we're interested in. And we can look at a network analysis or an indirect comparison, indirect meta analysis to answer this kind of question. Sometimes we might be interested in individual participant data meta analysis. And beyond the types of meta analysis, I hope I've been able to communicate um, the nine steps that are involved in the conduct of meta analysis and shed some light on how we might formulate our question and how we might determine the need for a review and a meta-analysis. In subsequent lectures, I and my colleagues will be talking to you about how to conduct, how to actually implement each of the nine steps that I earlier articulated for conducting a meta-analysis. I want to thank you for your patience and your participation in this lecture. And I want to encourage you um, to follow the subsequent lectures because I believe that in this era of evidence-based me medicine or evidence-based public health or evidence-based population health, really understanding how to interpret, how to critically appraise, and how to conduct a meta-analysis is an important skill set that you would find useful. Thank you very much and have a great day.